Jennifer Johnson, director here at the Mayor, and I'd like to welcome you to the 27th Annual Helen Clark Berlin Symposium. The Berlin Symposium is always held in conjunction with the college's annual exhibition of contemporary art. We are surrounded today by the 107th Annual Exhibition, Zeitgeist, the art scene of teenage Basia. Before we get started, I would like to thank someone who couldn't be here with us today. College trustee Mary Gray Shockey has generously supported every annual exhibition since the 100th, including this one. If you feel enriched being here right now, as I do, then Mary deserves most of that gratitude as she has made this possible. The annual exhibition of contemporary art is one of several important traditions and contributions that make up the Louise Jordan Smith legacy. Smith was one of the first five resident professors when the college was founded as Randolph Macon Women's College in, 19, in 1891. In 1900, she declared, I want an annual exhibition. It should be understood that each year, the best pictures should be purchased for a permanent collection. If the history of our nation may be foreseen by the light which other nations give us, we may know that our influence will last longest through our art. The first annual exhibition was installed in 1911. On the occasion of the 80th annual exhibition, friends and family of Helen Clark Berlin, class of 1958, established a symposium in her honor, which would expand and extend the educational impact of the exhibition. This year's symposium is also supported in part by three of our mayor members, Barbara McCarthy, class of 1973, Julie McGowan, class of 1969, and Dana Redmond, class of 1960. I'd like to thank communications professors Jay Jackson Beckham and Jennifer Gothier for further support of this weekend's programming with the Sarah Driver Digital Filmmaking and Lecture Fund, established through the generosity of Albert and Martha Lou Driver. Alan and Lou Driver have <coughs> immeasurably advanced our filmmaking curriculum here at the college. I especially thank the wonderful people before you for being here and sharing their experiences, their creativity, and insights with all of us. And it's my pleasure to introduce distinguished alumna and moderator of today's panel, Sarah Dreyer. Sarah graduated from Randolph Macon Women's College in 1977 with majors in theater and classics. She received her MFA in film from New York University and has been a major player in the downtown New York independent film scene ever since. She gained initial recognition as producer of two early films by Jim Jarmusch, Permanent Vacation, 1980, and Stranger Than Paradise, 1984. She has directed two feature films, Sleepwalk, in 1986, and When Pigs Fly, 1993 as well as a notable short film, You Are Not I, in 1981. Her most recent documentary, and the reason we are all here today, is Boom For Real, The Late Teenage Years of Jean-Michel Basquiat. And I hope everyone was able to see it either last night or on, uh, on Thursday night when we had our private screening for the Randolph College community. It's been a pleasure working with Sarah to bring to campus the film and this wonderful accompanying exhibition, Zeitgeist, the art scene of Teenage Basquiat. Sarah is the ultimate instigator, connection maker, and collaborator. As rich as this weekend has been, believe it or not, this was just a fraction of Sarah's ideas to enrich and broaden the understanding of the film and exhibition. The entire population of East Village might have been transported here had logistics and budget alone. <laughs> So please join me in welcoming one of this college's most distinguished and accomplished alums, Sarah Dreyer. And then I'd like to, to introduce my posse. Um, Marianne Monforte, um, she co-curated with me, and Carlo McCormick was also not here. Also. a little bit about yourself as an artist and as a, um, you know, and also working on an art magazine that you've been involved with for many years. I am currently, uh, and 25 years in, the associate publisher of Bomb Magazine, which is an art and literary quarterly that started in 1981. Uh, I 
will say that for the longest part of my involvement with the fine art world, I have been more or less like shoring up the business end of the art world. Um, I did start collecting in 1981. This little Kenny Sharp back here was the first piece I bought. And it turns out it actually was the first piece he ever sold in a gallery. So, you know, Del and Del were connected. And I went on to buy uh, some Basquiat's carries, and, uh, and I really never stopped. Um, I've done uh, many things in the art world. And only, uh, I would say, now five years ago, I went back to my own practice, which is what I came to New York to do in the first place. So, I'm 40 years involved in the New York art world. I feel like uh, it was a more or less like a close encounter of the third kind that brought me to the Lower East Side and involved with all of these incredible artists in the first place. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. I'm going to leave you guys.
bacteriologist and been, always been in the lab. And I've always been a photographer. And I lived with Jean-Michel Basquiat in 1979 and 80. And I have an archive of his collection that I, that I saved back and sort of put away for 30 years. And should I talk about that? Yeah, and how Martha, because Martha was at first really, you were almost interested in getting that collect, uh, Alexis's archive was, the first, was when we first started talking. Right, yeah. Right, so um, I, when we lived together, he was just, Jean was just leaving the, str the street and uh, was like, we sort of co coalescing his artwork to take it to another place. And um, he didn't have a canvas at the time, but he would use everything available at, to make his art, including just painting the floor, or the wall, or the, you know, appliances, whatever. Um, and did he have any canvas then? No. I should have not thought about that, but you know, whatever. So he worked on paper and and found objects. And when he moved on, I kept some of the work and some of the clothes he painted up for me and just put them aside and continued on my life. And then uh, I, I got a safety deposit box for a lot of the, I, the, the works on paper. Some of the works I framed and were always up on the wall and there was a mural on my wall and a bathroom door that I took off the bathroom door and mounted on the wall. But um, I was, I had two kids, raised them, uh, had a busy uh, career in the embryology laboratory and didn't really look at the work for 30 years. And then after Hurricane Sandy, I became concerned that uh, there was, I hadn't been to the, the safety deposit box and we were in a flood air zone and we were flooded, but the bank was two blocks up, but not in the flood zone, but it was in a basement, the safety deposit box, so I was really nervous about it, but our, the hospital that I worked at was also flooded and we had a huge catastrophe. And so it was a very busy time, and at the end of the year, I managed to get over to the safety deposit box. At first, they couldn't even find my box. I hadn't been there for so long. And I had no documentation. There was no computer record. I was just like a little card, and I had a key. And so we were able to piece it together. I found the, um, the box, and when I opened it up, I was like, oh my gosh, I have all this, this work, and it's, important and so people started coming around and taking a look at it and saying, oh my gosh, you've got to do something about, you know, with this work. Let's be. Okay, I move around a lot. No, no, it, it, it sounds like a connection that Okay, no, it's me. I, I move around. So, uh, I, just, I realized I had to do something about this. So, I began doing some research and Sarah came over and I showed the work to her, and she was also enthusiastic about the work. Yeah. And I saw your photographs. And my photographs. Some of the most beautiful photographs I've ever seen taken, especially at that age. Right. So, so young. Yeah, I bought a camera at that time uh, to take pictures of Sean and his artwork. And uh, at the time, I was working at Rockefeller University, and there was a dark room there. And somebody showed me how to uh, develop and print. It was really fabulous. And so I was taking black and white, these black and white photographs of Jean at that time. And also, you were, I mean, it's so interesting to me because you're a scientist, but you were always in the art world, and you were always at clubs, and you were always, you know, you're always into music, the arts. And I think science and art actually are a kind of beautiful marriage because. You can't be a great scientist without having a great imagination. Correct. And and those that two fields really intersect. And also notice her socks. But also Alexis started the first IVF program with a doctor in you know IVF um, 
in vitro fertilization was in its very early days then. And uh, you started yeah, the clinic. The first lab in, uh, at Cornell University in New York. There were other, there's a, the first clinic in, in the America is in Virginia, at the Eastern Virginia Medical Center. But uh, it, it was very, it, the, the whole procedure of in vitro fertilization was totally, it was, it was a very controversial. Well, I remember you told me that you were studying tropical diseases, and then Ronald Reagan dropped all the funding for tropical diseases, and then you got interested in the fertility business. Right, and because I had cell culture uh, experience, I was culturing malaria parasites, I was able to just segue into in vitro fertilization with my culture techniques. Okay. Marianne and Lee, you got set in France for a very long time. Uh, how did you, and, and Marilyn, you were involved also with the Puerto Rican community um, in New York, and could you just talk about your friendship, you know, um, all, all of us, like I remember seeing you at clubs, you know, 35 years ago. I was definitely at clubs. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, I met Lee when I was in I know for sure it was 1981 because I was involved with the Fund Gallery. I mean, that is the gallery that I walked into and saw this little Kenny Sharp. <coughs> and it just, it actually sort of brought me back into an interest in visual arts because up until then, uh, there was so much minimal art and conceptual art. There was a lot to look at. And you'd go to an artist studio and you'd talk, 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 talk. Drove me crazy. So it was the first time I felt like there was this new sort of schwa dart happening where uh, there was just energy and enthusiasm and lots to see and there was just a, a love of art that uh, was not just academic and it caught me. Uh, so I came back to the art world at that time. I had been involved in loft jazz music before that and I did some costume design for Lamont, I went on a tour with them. But in 1981, I really stepped back into the art world, and that was probably when I met me. Um, did you meet at the Mud Club? No, I probably met at the Fun Gallery. Oh, at the Fun Gallery? Yeah, I, I really had a, a, a very uh, tight affiliation with the Fun Gallery. Uh, Could you talk about the Fun Gallery just a little bit? Because that was such an interesting. It started out like a, um, more or less like a storefront, half a storefront on 11th Street, very small. Or actually, maybe even started in Patty Astor's apartment on East 3rd Street. And it was more like a cocktail party slash gallery. And then uh, she hooked up with Bill Stelling in maybe 1979 or 80 or something. And he was uh, doing roommate service. And instead of like renting the apartment, they changed uh, this ground floor apartment on 11th Street into an art gallery. And it wasn't long before the art world started to kind of take note of these more, uh, you know, not your average white box type gallery. And um, in a couple of years, it moved to a bigger space on East 10th Street. And in no time at all, there were over 100 galleries in the East Village. And they were all showing very interesting work uh, way outside the uh, what, you know, what was the, uh, you know, standard art world bill of fare. I mean, there were all kinds of artists from all walks of life, you know, not necessarily, there was no MFA required to be an artist, none of that, you know. If you had the goods and you had some talent and you wanted to put it out there, there was opportunity in the East Village at that time. So I was very involved with the Fun Gallery and they also showed graffiti art, and, and it was Lee, it was um, A1, did he show there? No, no he was Sidney Jim, yes. Dondi, um, Fred, uh, Futura. Futura. I mean, we had a very interesting uh, roster of artists, and Jane Dixon was like our only woman in the gallery. And and Jane Dixon's involved. pieces are these two over here. Yeah. And I've worked, I've worked there some, like Patty and um, Bill, they party probably maybe a little partier than I did. So I would come in on the weekend 
kids who do that like morning. <laughs> uh, so I, I did have like a shift that I would take over for them. And I started buying some things uh, from them and during that time as well. Uh, so that was and what happened to your Basquiat's? I had three of them and it's funny because I had heard that he sold a painting to Henry Geldseller. And I'm not going to tell you what the price was because it's not the price that I'm ever hearing anybody ever sell. But I said to Joan, oh, well, I'll buy a painting for that. And uh, I gave him the money. And he came back like three days later with three. And I paid him the balance. So I had three pieces. And I did tell him at that time that these represented my homes. So I held on to them. And what was that? What, and this was 1981. OK. And um, in 1989, my daughter was born. And that's when I sold the first one to get a bigger apartment in my building so that we would each have like a bedroom. So that was my first home. And then the second one was about 15 years ago when I was married. And I moved to bed and I bought my brownstone. Uh, the, the down payment was, in part, the second one. And I still have a beautiful uh, one left, which is going to get me into the old folks' home. <laughs> <laughs> Those are my husbands. Yeah. <laughs> Lee, did you have any influence work? Um, yeah, I, I do have one. Uh, it's, a, it's a pencil rendering that is like the first time I've ever seen disappearing pencil uh, because it's so faded. Uh, but it was, it's a beautiful saying. It's kind of one thing about death. Um, and, you know, Jean and I had like a very turbulent um, relationship. You know, and uh, we never really spoke again. It's that poor Rican kind of like, you know, I'll stand my ground, you stand yours. And um, uh, so I have that one. It's in the closet because I just don't want the light to hit But it's a, it's a poster from one of the sort of things. And, uh, and, um, but yeah, I, I always admired his work after I got to understand how to connect the dots that he has in each one of them. Because, you know, at first I was like, that's just bad. You know, I was like, what, why is he painting like that? And it was because of my graffiti background where it was like I said in the film, you did the, it was taboo, it was, it, was, it was a sin to let your paint drip, to, to your lines not to be crisp and straight or round or whatever, and very beautifully faded and color selection and com composition. And I was like, what's this dude doing? Like, you know, why is he you know, destroying the canvas um, like that? And I saw him creating the first the first uh, postcards. Um, the, the, the there's, postcard. there's a postcard in the back. There's postcards here, I suppose. Yeah. And he was creating, for the most part, most of them, not sure of those two, but you know, maybe they were. He was pretty much creating them quickly um, uh, in the studio that we, we, we all shared. Um, and that's where I was creating my first pieces on canvas with Jean didn't have any money uh, or any materials to work with at that time. So, um, uh, sorry I'm leading into story after story, but he, he wasn't, uh, he didn't have any you know, pot to piss in. So he could create stuff on whatever he could find. And there was a lot of stuff on the streets, as you can tell, where you could find anything in you know, ready-made art. It was already was there for the hanging, ready to wear. Well, I remember Tuesday nights in New York City was garbage night. That was where you could leave out like wooden tables and all, you know, any kind of like bigger yeah. items. And uh, and I remember seeing Louise Nevelson, the great sculptress, uh, out on a rainy night going through the garbage looking for pieces of wood. And she had these mink eyelashes that were sort of dripping with rain. <laughs> and, <laughs> And this fur coat on, and she used to wear these big hats. You know, she was very theatrical looking, and she looked on the corner like a block away from me. But, but I remember we were getting a lot of stuff. Too, so that's how we furnished our home. That's how yeah. I furnished my apartment. That's, that's how I furnished my studio recently. I found brand new stuff, or very mildly used stuff, artist materials, brushes, everything. I found it in the backyard of my building, and I just bring them up. I'm like, wow. You know, it's a little present. Yeah. yeah. And 
and um, Luke, you also. Uh, Oh, um, you know, I know that you guys talked about books and literature, because um, you you know talked in the film about how you read Burroughs and crime novels yeah. and, um, and everybody was. I started, I was reading James M. Cain. I was reading Naked Lunch too. Right. We were all like kind of reading the same books. Yeah, yeah. And. Uh, um, and you also have a lovely piece that I, we should have asked for for the show. Yeah. Um, that beautiful collage, you see it in the film. Well, I, yeah, I, well, I have four Cub Scouts. I have, uh, I have a postcard, like the one in the vitrine, actually maybe even the very next one he made because it's also got a strip from the photo booth with that particularly oiled looking skin and, and, uh, and the Mohican. Um, uh, and then I have a painted sweatshirt, and I think I bought both the sweatshirt and the postcard for a dollar a piece. But then I was working uh, from 1976 to 1979. I worked at the Strand Bookstore in Manhattan, which was a real hotbed. Um, we had, you know, all kinds of people. Uh, it, yeah, it still is. Although it was, well, one thing that's probably not true about it anymore is that we had a lot of people who come in for work for a month and then find some kind of golden ladder out of there. You know, I worked with Lux Interior of the Craps, he was there for a month, uh, etc. Lots of people. And at one point, um, I decided to start a magazine. And um, none of us had any money. At the Strand, we were still paid in cash. You know, this is how low down and kind of things were. Um, and um, so the, the the way the magazine worked is that everybody was going to make, initially it was 300 copies of anything, but that was too much for most people. So brought it down to 200, 200 copies of anything or 200 individual found pieces maybe. And um, they bring them all to me and I design some kind of packaging. And then we collate everything and they put them into the packages. And that was a magazine. It ran for four issues. And for the last issue, I asked Jean for something, and I knew that he didn't have, as Lee said, to know pot to piss in, so I offered to Xerox whatever he gave me. And he gave me this incredible collage, it's really beautiful, but it's got relief elements, so it couldn't be Xerox. And Very Jean Michel. Yeah, yeah, and I, yeah, I still have it. Uh, and then I asked, you know, I said, Jean, I'm sorry, I can't be Xerox, can you give me something else? And he gave me, frankly, a really shitty collage that he probably made in about five minutes. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's the one that ran in the magazine because that was easy. Um, it's just, it's what it is. It's, it's a eight, you know, eight by ten photograph, of a bunch of white men in about 1930s, some convention, and he's like barred all their eyes and written bad across the top. <laughs> you know? um, so, uh, so anyway, so I just kind of. Uh, Acquired these Basquiat's, and um, and you know I have thought of um, of selling them and stuff, but I realized no, I I love them. I don't want to part with them. So I've sold a lot of things in my life, but not those. Alexis, um, I, I don't want to stop I want to talk a little bit about the art that's in the you know in the room, and um, can you talk a little bit about um, uh, you know. You used to, you know, kind of play games with Sean. It was very playful. A lot of your photographs are great. Like he's got. Can you talk a little bit about some of the playfulness of the photographs, like when he was being fierce, when he was being yeah. uh, uh, with silly putty on his nose? And so, like that. so one of the things we did in, in the house was uh, in the apartment was set up different scenarios, and then I would photograph them, and um, he would become the art piece. And, himself and and I photographed there's a, a couple series uh, one of which he's um, put our little black and white TV set into the refrigerator into the refrigerator and he's wearing a football helmet and he's got this little ray gun which is a little uh, labeling device that Michael Holman gave him for a birthday present and he is just manipulating the TV and 
finding different image, images. Uh, we were very involved with politics. I'm still involved with politics. And uh, there is, uh, you can see the, um, in some of the images, you can see like the first George Bush. Or, you know, there's, we were always interested in, in politics. And um, in another series, he found a box of silly putty and, um, and these broken glasses on the street. Everything came from the street. And he, he just became the art piece. And I photographed it. And so um, then uh, in some of these photographs, he's shaved his head. He had the mohawk initially when I first met him, this mohawk. mohawk. And uh, then it grew in, and oh, there's um, and then it grew in, and at some point he was with some guys and just shaved his, the top half of his head so that it appeared like he was coming and going at the same time. I'm not sure <laughs> how that was, but anyway, that was his concept. So he was everything about him. He was 24/7 art. I mean, he was constantly working and thinking about his art. You know, and I, uh, we'd go out at night partying. I'd go to sleep. He'd be up at night with the music on. Maybe there's a famous story uh, Michael Holman told me where he came over to to your house to get Sean for his birthday. His birthday's in December. And, um, and um, you had nailed an a album, a public image on, your, on her wall as an art, as an art decoration, a, a cover of, of a public image. And, um, and Sean was discussing, he was like, you're going to nail records onto your wall? I'm going to nail a book. And so that's why that photograph, you see Naked Lunch, is nailed to the wall. Yes. <laughs> Well, you told us. Oh, okay. Yeah. No. Uh, Luke, you know, also, Luke, you also are here at Mark now. You've been making your collages again. Mm -hmm. I just saw them in an art show. Really? So. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I made I mean, well, I, I had to decide at 18 which road I was going to go down. Um, if, um, if I got a full scholarship, because my parents had no money, if I got a full scholarship to a good school, I go to university and become a writer. And if I didn't, I go to art school and become a commercial artist. So that was, and I got a full scholarship to Columbia, so I became a writer. Um, and I made collages. I mean, I did a lot of drawing and stuff like that, but um, I was never satisfied with my skills. And so I made collages. Um, for many years, I made, and during this period, you know, I was making flyers for bands and stuff like that. Um, and then it became so much about like kind of making art for a particular real-world function, such as advertising a gig. And so when I dropped out of the scene around age 30, I stopped making visual art and. Then, you know, a couple of years ago, I thought, wait, why haven't I been making visual stuff all these years? Why did I ignore that whole part of myself? So um, I got back to making collages slowly, which have been accumulating in my house. And I put, I put up batches of them on Instagram and I'm feeling brave. You know? <laughs> uh, but, I, it's, but I really I do feel like a more complete human being as a result of no longer neglecting this form of the neglected bit. And Alexis, you continued with your art as well, which is now woven into your science. Right. So I've uh, been uh, an embryologist for 30 years, and I've been taking, um, capturing images and storing them in files and for these 30 years, and uh, it's always been a part of what I uh, did, and it's been, you know, I've, seen, I've been uh, privileged to see, like, amazing fertilization in the lab and, and embryos, and so I've been t accumulating these images, and I'm starting to show them and manipulate them 
as well. So considering what the next step is for those. And I would say when I saw your photographs, and since you shot so many of them in a series, I thought, oh, yeah, that was one of the reasons I started thinking about film, because I was like, I can animate these, you know, because there was just one right after the other. Leah, I wanted to ask you, you know, your um, Frankenstein, what, what year was Frankenstein made? 1989. 1989? And so, that it's, and it's spray paint. Yeah, it's all spray paint. Only. But you're now working in different mediums, and you've also been starting to work in sculpture which comes directly from your love of drag racing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in the closet. I'm in the closet. I just have it. I'm server. <laughs> to a certain extent, I'm server of the whole underground street racing that happened in New York and Detroit and Philadelphia. But... Um, Can you just talk about that just for a second, just about what the illegal drag racing was like in, in the late 70s, early 80s? Where yeah, I mean, it's... Wow, it's, it's, and cover it in one sentence, but honestly, but um, you know, I, I first and foremost, I loved cars, and I grew up around a junkyard right at the foot of the Brooklyn Bridge. So I would climb up these mountains of cars that were taken off the streets where they were just littered everywhere, and they would stack them to to consolidate your know, room on top of each other. So I would be in those stacks of cars, five, six, seven car stories high. And you know, stripping them, just amazed at all this design of the court in the 50s, at that time, 60s. Uh, this was in the late 60s, so a lot of cars from the 50s were now being circulated into the jump. Anyway, just looking at those cars and then hearing them outside my house, you know, being hot riding by all these young teenagers, I was like, wow, I was fascinated by why are they doing this? And then shortly after, in the very early 70s, I started getting known of all these guys, this whole subculture of guys building cars to go fast, race each other, you know, um, as you would think it would be uh, like an American graffiti or any of those films, but I quickly found out that it was a whole sub-business going on uh, for high dollar stakes, you know, racing. So because of all the underworld money, whether it was from the, you know, Good fellow guys and the drug trade, it was filtering, it was being filtered through the whole street racing game back in the day. So at any given night, you would go on, you know, you, you congregate with all these guys with cars on trailers that were not even legal on the street. They would be on trailers and they'd bring them out into a designated area um, on the highway. And was it the FDR? Was it right well, in Manhattan? Well, it's, yeah, the FDR. Oh, yeah, you went once to one of the, yeah. That, that was more recreational, but I was hanging out on the JFK uh, conduit there, where, right next to the airport, where there was a lot of noise from the planes and the cars. Um, the cars were louder than the planes, believe me. Um, you know, open exhaust, like no lights, no windshield wipers, plastic windows, gutted doors. They looked like stink, but they ran like, you know. Uh, and, uh, the uh, you know, thousand horsepower cars, and they were there to race 50, 100 grand at a time. So I witnessed some of those races, and I was just fascinated by not just the money or the flashiness of the scene, but the, um, the way these guys tinkered with these cars and worked with different uh, you know, materials. And anyway, that's, that's also influenced your work a great deal. It has. That's where it bled into, like, you know, just wanting to see how materials coincide with each other, how they look, you know, particularly lightweight alloys, aluminum, and titanium, and nickel, and nickel, you know, some of them not so lightweight, but really beautiful. So I've been wanting, and I've been fusing that with what I've experienced in subway tunnels and the yards, where you're, you know, surrounded by concrete and steel, very little wood, but, you know, very, you know, uh, just very cold materials. So I've been wanting to build up on like memories, those you know those layers of memories that I'm going back to and just like seeing all these geometric shapes and uh, shadowy things in the night. So. And I remember you telling me um, when, when I interviewed you when you were prepared to go to the subway stations, to, you know, at the end of the line, um, that you would you would outline what you were going to do on the train inside your mother's kitchen cabinets. Yeah, well, no, my, 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 my mother's kitchen cabinet is sort of like an offshoot, like a 
pre-rehearsal, which is like doodling, you know, really. But I created a lot of my preliminary drawings to those subway cards in my mother's apartment. Uh, Full-scale color drawings uh, based on DC and Marvel comics and on the ground comics at the time. And we even advertisements uh, that you saw all the subways. So a little bit of Mad Men were thrown in at that time into my work. Um, and I was fascinated by um, um, <coughs> but, um, Horizon, we lived on the top, um, basically on the top floor of our building. Um, and I could see the horizon from the sunset and so mm -hmm. and so forth. So, yeah, I was influenced to make those drawings so that I could have the balls enough to say, now I'm going to go get into my masquerade, <coughs> slip into the yards, and create this big masterpiece on the side of the subway. I think people don't realize it took you entire, how many cars did you paint? I actually painted, they rounded up to 150 cars, but it's actually lower than that. It's about 125 cars. Uh, but full, full cars. Full length, longer than that wall, that wall there, top, you know, just as tall, and uh, you know, painting it in the window of anywhere between eight to ten hours. So painting that whole cover of the wall, watching the clock, the watch, and watching the watch, and uh, <laughs> which is only the only piece of jewelry I ever had at the time. And one thing I wanted to ask you, too, because I, I remember I asked you about did your mom ever take you to art galleries where, where you were exposed to art when you were young, and then you started telling me about her love of movies and how handsome leading men, and that you would go to see all these like classic films. And because the subway car is a moving image, I just wondered if that had any connection to each other, that that, that would attract you because of growing up in the movies. Yeah, it's kind of like a, you know, it's like a metamorphosis from Moving image, you know, from, from seeing films on TV and at theaters, my mother to watching these, like, what I would call negatives, you know, slides, as cars seem to be because they're all connected and there's 10, 10 cars per train set. And then, you know, I was like, yeah, maybe cover the whole, the whole entire car to make it, you know, I was influenced by Cliff from 59 and Blade because they were doing them before, before I. Uh, for myself, but um, I so I just saw it to the I, I saw the next platform before you know after what they had been doing. I'm like, you know, if I continue to do this in a serial way, the conversation will change from vandalism and you know a bunch of misfits and misdirected youth to guys that are very calculated, they're very serious. Um, an act of you know vandalism is not a serial thing per se. It's like, you know, you do it one time, you scratch your name, ha ha, and you laugh into the sunset. But we're doing this in a very calculated, um, thoughtful way. This is an art to it. And the fact that you see that point six million people that rode the trains, uh, no, four million people that rode the trains at that time uh, would be like either clapping or, you know, eyebrows rising or even It's arguing. beautiful to see those trains. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were blossoming. They were very blossoming flowers, like Klaus Holdenberg said. You know, they were like a banquet of flowers that came in, brightened up the place, the mood, the swing of the day, and then it just went out of your view. And it's like, whoa, what was that? It was the greatest high. So I just felt like I needed to elaborate on that and just also create a, you know, a, you know, a heroic persona for myself. Like I'm included now in the conversation, and then it just led into the next. And the, the piece you have here, this is an oil painting, right? Or what did you use? What the, the, the tag, the Lee tag, not Frankenstein. Oh, oh uh, that is a combination. The one over there. Mm -hmm. That's a combination of um, uh, acrylic, oil, and spray paint. And uh, what year was that? That was recent. That was 2016. Oh. And it's my love of like I'm very I've been attracted for. Wow to um, um, Laszlo, I can never say his last oh, name. No, I always say Naji because it's a Y in the end. Yeah. It's not a, Naj, okay, I learned something. So uh, Laszlo Naj, uh, because Maholi is like Maloney. <laughs> I keep wanting to say that word. But it's like, yeah, Laszlo Naj. Um, his love of color and coordination and geometric shapes, and it just like reminds me of like the chaotic nature of different ways, 
and the city itself, just life in general, just like all these interjecting intersections and people. So I was like, wow, and just the way he composed the color and all, the paintings are just beautiful. I was like, wow, if I was painting trains, that's what I would be doing now. So I just had to interject my name, Lee, and felt like, well, if you're looking at the Lee and you're holding it on the Lee, you lose Naj. But if you're looking at Naj, that's what you pronounce right now. Yeah. <laughs> you lose the Lee. So it's an optic trick, trickery that I love about the piece. So I wanted to do a whole series based on it. I look forward to seeing that. Um, Marianne, yeah. why don't you talk a little bit about your sculpture here, and when exactly did you start revisiting your um, your muses? Well, let's see. My mother passed away in 2012, and I think that was the biggest like kick because she's only 26 years older than I am, and she lived a life. She was 86 when she passed away, and. It just like woke me up to this like um, I always intended to get back to it. And it seemed like no time like the present. And I had been looking at work I did in my final year of college, basically. So I um, applied to a residency. I figured the only way to like break out of my art world business and have time where I was not interrupted and didn't really think about anything else <coughs> to go to an art residency. So I applied to a residency in Michigan called Oxbow. And I basically laid out my whole story, totally honest, and I got accepted. I was shocked. And that was sort of the kickstart. So I would say 2013 is when I uh, seriously uh, made that transition. And I came home, and I live in a brownstone, and I took a wall down, I made a big studio at home. And then my husband, who studied art as well, decided he wanted to get, and I then moved into a studio. <laughs> it was just a little too much, you know. Um, so I have a studio now close to the Brooklyn Museum, and I go there, like I work three days a week at and as much as I can in the four days. I'm and you have a big show people. coming up. You have a two-person show coming up. I do up. have a two-person show at a very sizable space, probably this big, um, with another woman, uh, Charlotte Beckett, another sculptor. And I'll probably have about at least 25 pieces in that show. Wow. You know, very, it's, I'm very excited about it. So this piece here, uh, let's see. I started out very much uh, like where I ended off, and I, I always used wire. Um, it was the 70s. I, I had like arrested development, you know. I was conceptual, uh, and I worked with wire. But I started making um, wire bricks, exactly the size of a brick, but just like a line of wire. I would stack them up, and you really couldn't tell if it was uh, two or three dimensions if you took a picture of it. And um, I bricked up my window, and you know, it had this psychological impact, like you know, a bricked up, like abandonment. So I realized like there was real power in these objects, and I made cubes too, which was of course a nod to Solomon, but mine were like totally wonky; they barely held their shape. And I stacked them up five. I realized I'm five feet tall now. And that became like a self-portrait. So it had a lot of humanity in this sort of very conceptual, um, you know, kind of parameter. And I don't know. So I've gone on to do other things. The Colin Kaepernick affair really hit me. And the whole like major league sports and the the um, you know auctioning of human bodies of, you know, power, and I just, it just kind of blew my mind that he was treated so poorly. So I started making these wood balls that were completely distorted and looked like maybe lead balloons or something. And I made a series of them. This is the sort of largest one, 
Um, I have one that's like that I smashed and it's crushed. I have flat concrete ones that just look totally deflated. So there was a series of these football icons. And so when we were curating the show, the people at Howell had seen my work and suggested, as well as uh, did Sarah and Lee, that maybe I should be in the show too. <laughs> and I was thrilled to be able to do that. And so the football seemed sort of logical. It seemed to me that Jean would have gotten a big, huge kick out of that <laughs> concrete football. And I. Ben was wondering, oh, but how are they going to show it? Where are they going to put it on? And just to alleviate that anxiety, <coughs> I made the pedestal. So that's my, that's that piece. How did you make the pedestal? It's called oh, NFL. Uh, I basically used a chicken wire armature and plaster gauze, and some of that is cardboard. And so I weighted the bottom with uh, some concrete so that it would be sturdy. But the football, it, it's, it weighs about two pounds or something. I mean, it's nothing. It's really hollow. And I mix this uh, synthetic mortar in concrete to what I call concretized things. So I've made a lot of things that look like concrete, and it's more like a concrete paint. So that's the story behind that. Yeah. Are there any questions from the audience? Just create that wind in the sails that you need to 
of expression. You know, I've always said this, <coughs> that the, the duty of many artists is to have their finger on the pulse of society, you know. And uh, if you can do that, you're open to a lot of arguments within yourself, but you're also open to a lot of, um, you know, like you're saying, you know, being a sponge and, and then just taking an order, um, sort of being the catfish, you know, and you're kind of like scour on the bottom of society, you know, and then, you know, you, you dish it out with, with the arts, whatever you're, you're creative with. So, um, yeah, I like, to, I like to listen a lot. I also like to talk a lot, but I listen to a lot of music, a lot of creation of music, and attitudes and fashion, and, everything, you know, across the board, because politics is too depressing, but I know that I'm leading towards, like, you know, piercing into politics by what I gather around me. So it's all this fine print. You know, this is just personal thinking for myself, but I think a lot of artists think, like, think the same. Um, one thing, uh, uh, Brian Eno's coinage of the word senius, um, S-C-E-N-I-U-S, uh, meaning the collective genius of a scene. You know, and you got to figure, New York City, say, you know, 1977 to 1980, something, um, just brought all this stuff together. And the visual arts work is a large subject here, but you know, music, film, theater, uh, not so much literature, I guess, but all the others were just uh, going very strong. And I think in the, in the moment, there were people who were inspired to transcend themselves, who might, in another context, might not have been uh, so moved. Um, the other thing, too, is that we had the uh, tremendous advantage of being surrounded by a lot of contrivance. A lot of garbage, and that and garbage is always great, you know. And the thing is, it may seem simple now to think, yeah. I mean, well, here we are on the Lower East Side, or, or any, indeed any part of New York City at the time. Um, and to me, it kind of felt like it was like a soft apocalypse. It was like maybe the world isn't coming to an end, but maybe time is coming to an end, and we've got the regurgitation of all previous history just going on right now because. Literally, you walk out the door, and um, there would be just stuff. Uh, you know, there'd be Victorian furniture. There'd be business cards from the 1920s. I mean, I, uh, one of my sub careers is writing about photography, and that has its source in some pile of photographs that some guy was selling on the sidewalk on Astor Place in 1980 that I bought. Um, that that's started the whole chain of my thinking about photography. Um, stuff like that. I, it was, you know, the past was present, and the past was present as this object for contemplation and use. You know, it was all ad hocism. It was whatever you found, um, what is this thing? Maybe you don't know what it is, but maybe you can figure a new use for it, which might be in complete contradiction to its original use. Um, and um, that was, so that was specific to that time and place. You know, it's, it's sort of like um, when the Reagan era really got started as of the mid 80s, um, and the impression of both the future and the past, both coming to an end simultaneously there. Um, and, but, you know, I've got to figure that there are analogies in, in the world that, you know, if you look for um, what other people are discarding, um, it's always going to be interesting. It's always going to be out of time, you know. It's whatever, whatever you can do. Um, so there's a bit of a contradiction in terms here. The first thing I said was the seniors, the collective, you know, the, the zeitgeist, you know, really, but the collective of the creative drive. But at the same time, the importance of going against the whatever tide is taking over the beach at, at that moment, you know. So it's uh, it's individual and a group thing at the same time, and it's going with and going against at the same time. So I came from Seattle, Washington. It was kind of an outpost at the time, really very far from any kind of cultural. It felt very 
uh, you know, just like a frontier town at the time. And I wanted to go to New York, and I came to New York to Barnard College, and I quickly met, like, the most exciting people I've ever met. And they've remained my friends right here um, to this day. And New York was just so, I mean, it was in decay, but it was so alive, and there was so much going on. And, and the music scene, um, we were exposed to punk rock, and at the time, at, at, well, we were still at Columbia, the Ramones came to, uh, to play at Columbia, I remember, and Patti Smith was uh, a huge factor. And we just, as soon as I graduated and got, got a job, I was crashing on the floor for until I got a job, we moved downtown to the East Village where it was just, you know, 24-7 art, I would say. And it wasn't, it was, there was dance, theater, and film, and video was just kept coming in. It was, you know, so much was going on. The subways were just incredible art forms. Everything. And so it, it just was just a dynamic place to be. And it just, it spawned itself, you know, more of itself. And I think it was, uh, you know, we, the, the rents were cheap. We were able to just get, a, get away with not working that much or <laughs> low level jobs. We could just subsist. We didn't eat much. We didn't pizza. We yeah, pizza, a slice <laughs> or a donut or whatever, and we, we just didn't care, you know. And we didn't have cell phones, so we didn't have that bill. We just had like a telephone and a Connet, a Connet bill and our rent, and that was it. And we could just and you can learn to turn off your meter on this with this poster meter, right? You could even <laughs> turn back your Connet meter so that you didn't even pay that. So um, there was a lot of guerrilla art, and and uh, again we were we were political, even if we were anti-political. I would say, and I think that's that's persisted in the East Village, though the city has changed dramatically, um, and it's no longer possible to live cheaply. I would say. I mean, maybe there is. Places in Brooklyn, I don't know, or the Bronx or something, but uh, it's uh, we made, we made the East Village very popular, I, I think, by our attractiveness, <laughs> and so now everybody wants to move there, and it's a very popular neighborhood in New York City. And it's been so I'd like to say one other thing too. We were also multi generational. There were a lot of the beats around. Yes. There were a lot of the old jazz. You'd see Dizzy Gillespie on the street, Cornette Coleman. Um, you'd see Robert Frank. You'd see Burroughs walking down the street. Alan Ginsberg lived in the same building. Right, and Alan Ginsberg lived in Luke's building. And uh, uh, William Burroughs lived around the corner from us. And you'd see him on the street. He'd have a three-piece suit on, he'd be carrying a cane. And he knew he had a dinner turn in his belt. And, he, and his cane looked, was actually a sword. <laughs> you know, he looked like somebody's very proper grandfather. So I think that was very important too. And um, and you know, having all these great artists who were, you know, our parents' age, who uh, you know had had chosen the lives they wanted to live, and had had, had made that their life goal was doing their art and um, paved the way. And paved the way. Up to that. Exactly. And then I remember Diego Cortez, who's in the film, he said, and, and why the reason we call it Zeitgeist, the show, was that um, he said that it was as rich as cafe culture in France or in Berlin in the 30s, um, and, and France in the early 20s and stuff. Um, but he said it was, you know, it was that kind of convergence of energy that just happens. And it's, it's cyclical. It will happen again somewhere else in the world. But it was just, it was, a, it was just kind of extraordinary. How, um, and because we could make and do things and poster, put posters up and do all these things that are now very illegal, um, there was no law. I mean, it was, you know, I could go out and shoot a film without any permits, without having to like have a lawyer who's going to tell me whether I can use this signage or that signage. Um, 
So there was a certain amount of freedom in that too. Total freedom. Yeah. Any more questions? Just an observation. I can I can confirm Lee's story about the cars because I lived in New York in the eighties coming up the West Side Highway. You get to the point after the George Washington Bridge where it's six lanes wide and there's a toll station a few miles up from there. At that section, the racers would block the road, literally putting their cars all the way across the road so none of the commuters or it was the middle of the night when it always happened. It would happen after midnight, two, three in the morning. They'd line up, block the road, all the cars would have to stop and they'd get, their, get themselves prepared and let the cars that had already gone by get far enough down the road, and then they would have their races. So I definitely witnessed that thing. That's how it goes. It's pretty wild. Well, yeah, yeah, I, have one, I have one question for you. You say in the film that, um, uh, that his time was short. You said you didn't necessarily think that Jean Michel knew he was going to die, because he was always working, as you said, but he was so prolific. He was an incredibly made an incredible amount of work in such a short period of time. But I wonder what you think his sense of time was. Do you think that was because he was in a bad car crash when he was a kid? So he had this sort of sense of urgency that others of us didn't quite have that drive in the same way. Um, yeah, I think that might have uh, contributed to that. That was, a, that was a very traumatic thing that he went through as a young boy, 10 years old or whatever it was. Um, and then he, he had spleen yeah. removed. So that's like, you know, car hitting you, um, being at that last moment when you see this object coming at you, it the most horrific thing as a child, processing that later on, and then seeing subsequently, you know, like the city falling apart around you. Because when that happened, so it must have been in the mid-60s, late 60s, it really didn't have any idea, like, the, the city was going to drop dead, as Gerald Ford said. So, you know, now he's seen all this, this beautiful decay uh, happening, and probably maybe there was an underlying, um, he was wired to an underlying sense that he, he had to hurry up. Um, I mean, the, the act of painting the way we did, especially with spray paint, which was, you know, it's a tool that no one ever thought ever becoming an art tool. You know, you paint your bicycle and you pick your fence and you're done and you put it away in your garage or whatever, but it became this tool that was wrapping. So I had a nickname for it, wrapping enamels. You know, and I think using that tool made you feel that you could you could basically cheat time, but you didn't have much time because you could do something faster than anyone else could traditionally. So working with spray paint and writing sayings or creating a masterpiece gave you a sense of like, wow, I can, I can cheat time, but do I have much time? And uh, I, I, I think uh, a number of things factored in to make him feel like, you know, I better create the most work I can now. Um, uh, you know, uh, because I have so much to say and there's just so much time I have. Well, I think the one thing, too, about Sean's work is it's so, like somebody like J.D. Ballard or certain writers, is that they're almost like prophets. Yeah. When you see Jean's work, it's so vibrant and alive, and it's dealing with issues we're dealing with today. And, uh, and, and they just jump out of you. Because Jean was not only a great painter, but he was a great writer. And through making this film, I really discovered he was a, and I think you pointed it out, Luke, he was a very advanced poet by the time he was about 18. Yeah, he did a lot of reading. There's something that I want to say, I don't know if it makes sense. Correct me, or help me out with this. Um, you know, garbage out on the streets, right? All this derelict, you know, just misused and unused, whatever stuff, and you can create something that was tangible and, you know, had a different meaning when you twisted it around and you cleverly put it together. And you made, like, I feel today the garbage is all a senseless dialogue. That's going on, you know. Yeah. The, you know, the, the talk, like just the, the misuse of information, um, and you know, and more than ever, I think it probably hinges, it probably demands that the literary, the the, the writing 
on the walls or the writing on the lines is more important now than ever before. You take those words and twist them around and, and make some sense of it, some truth. Am I, I mean, making sense? I mean, totally. I mean, words more than ever have to have a meaning because words, I mean, as used uh, by honest people and in literature, have to have their full weight and they have to completely avow their meaning because so much of what we face is verbiage that's meant to act as smoke to word vision and then dissipate, leaving everybody stupider than they were to begin with. So we got to counteract that by fully employing language for what's meant to be useful. And I think another thing we have to fully employ is community. I think one of the things in the film that's very strong is the sense of community and us talking about community. I don't think you have a community when you're communicating through email, through, you know, through, I mean, you're, you're, you're closer to someone if you call them on the phone. Yeah. Um, and things are always taken out of context, like words so easily taken out of context or meaning in an email or text. And, um, and I really encourage, you know, young people to really start getting in rooms together and talking to each other and making their own art fair and getting their own signals out whatever way they can. And, and we as the elders can help them do that. But I think that, that it's, it's, so, it's such an important thing to be in a room and just hang out and talk ideas. And um, it's just, it's very critical. And I think, and, and especially now with the political situation and everything, we really, and you know, I'm so moved by that March for Our Lives, those kids. You know, it made me remember going and protesting the Vietnam War when I was in ninth grade in Washington, D.C., when Randy Davis was shutting down the <coughs> government. And, uh, and, you know, we stopped that war. It was the high school, the college kids, you know, kids in their 20s, not older people, it was the young people. It was a very divisive time. It was the Vietnam War was a very divisive time, similar to this, and it really did take direct direct action, you know, and community. And, and they want to keep us divided, so yes. everybody should get together. <laughs> so I just want to thank everybody who came with me from New York. It means so much to me that you came and it's at my alma alma mater, and. Uh, Say the word, and um, um, it just—I'm so moved that how the film. I got so much support with that. This show. I want to thank Martha. I want to thank Randolph College and her staff and everyone. Um, it's really been a great weekend.